Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on causality. Today we talk about how to learn cause effect models. So what have we seen last time? Last time we introduced the structural causal models, which is now beyond the joint distribution for random variables, but it additionally also stores how the data was generated. So in a way it's a generative model, which is like a recipe, how to generate the data from scratch. <clears throat> so there are basically two big components here. The uh, most obvious one is that there are mechanisms. So there are little computer programs which generate basically the data that we observe. And the input to these computer programs is basically noise. Sometimes it's also another variable. Hello. So these um, two components, so the noise variables, yeah, they bring the randomness into the whole system. And the mechanisms, they are deterministic, so they're really like computer code. They basically translate the distributions that get in into something then that we observe afterwards, okay? And um, by having these assignment functions, additionally, we get an asymmetry here now between the cause and the effect, right? In the joint distribution, there's no, um, basically, the, whether the first or the second variable, there's no preference. I can apply the product rule, either starting with the first variable or I can apply the product rule starting with the second variable. So I can factorize it in two different ways and the joint doesn't tell me which one is the right one. However, when I have a structural causal model, then there's more assumptions. And so I have more precisely described what I observed. However, the difficulty of course is if I observe data, can I identify the structural causal model? So can I learn it? And today we will look at situations and assumptions under which we can learn these structural causal models from data. And uh, again, similarly to last time, we look at the two variable case because already in the two variable case, all these questions are interesting and one can um, understand the methods in the simplest case. So having a structural causal model, what does it buy us? So it buys us now the, the new things in the Perl's causal hierarchy. So beside the usual statement that we can do if we just have the joint distribution like conditioned on a certain variable, what is the distribution of the other variable? So that is about just, I see that x has value one, what is the distribution for y? The structural causal model allows me to answer questions where I set the value of x to a particular one and then I can ask the question, how is y changing? So and if x is the cause of y, then of course y will also change some of its value or its distribution when I set x to a particular value. If x is the effect and y is the cause, then setting x to a particular value doesn't change the situation at all. So we will see also there's some asymmetry in the interventional statement that, that come out. However, to get data from these interventional statements, I really have to perform experiments. So I cannot just get data just by observing, okay? Someone must do experiments. Maybe I observe someone doing experiments, that's fine, right? But in principle, it's not, um, so I have to interact with the environment in that case. And by combining observational statements and interventional statements, I can even say something about counterfactual statements. So which are counter to the fact, where the fact are basically the data that I observe. And then I can ask, so what if like a certain variable would have set to a different value. So what if I would have taken a different action? What would have been the outcome? Something that never has happened. And those are counterfactual statements. <clears throat> Some people argue that counterfactual statements and reasoning about it is something which makes us intelligent, right? So it's something we can think of situations that have happened in the past and then we might decide, okay, next time we do it differently because possibly if I do it differently, maybe the outcome will be better. And th that's counterfactual reasoning, which I think is really some essential property of intelligence. We also see that just by modeling a joint distribution, we won't get there. So we won't have the capabilities for that. Um, people like Julia Pearl, who invented most of this stuff here, um, they, they even claim that machine learning is up here, okay? So machine learning is only about finding correlations in the data. So you have a data set, a training data set, and then you train a neural network on it. And that is just capturing P of Y given X. So it's not really capturing anything about what if I choose X to be a particular value, what will be the outcome? 
but it's just modeling basically the joint distribution. Okay, and because of that, they, he says people interested in serious AI and in particular the machine learning people, they should look at this causal hierarchy. They should think how they should could extend to interactions with the environment. So how can they make use of such data? And of course, the machine learning researchers, they are, they are so numerous and so clever that they do. And so there are people who try to combine machine learning with causality. And we see a couple of examples in this lecture. Okay. Okay, so, so this is another um, slide from last time. Hi. Um, so there's the probabilistic world, which is all about joint distributions. And uh, from a probabilistic model, we can do probabilistic reasoning, which basically means we take the model like with parameters, and then we can say something about what to expect. Expectations could be calculated that say something, what are we expect to see in the world? And the other way around is, that we have observations and we learn a probabilistic model. We estimate the parameter or we get posterior distributions or whatever you do for your probabilistic modeling. And that's typically called statistical learning. And um, in parallel to that, we have the much more powerful causal models. So they are more powerful, but they also require much more information. And once we have those, we can have the same reasoning as down here. So we can talk about observations and outcomes and expectations. But additionally, we can also talk about what happens if certain actions are taken. So the causal model also captures more information of who is influencing really whom, okay? And so it's more powerful. Of course, now the question is, given observations, possibly from experiments, possibly just observations, under what assumptions can we also do causal learning? So infer the causal model, or at least decide which is cause, which is effect. And today we will exactly look at this situation. We only have observations and we want to infer from the observations basically the causal model. Where today it's only about two variables, so we only want to distinguish the case that X is the cause and Y is the effect or the other way around. So it's a binary decision, okay? So that's what we are doing today. Okay, um, where's my source? So my source is basically the book from Peters, Jansing and Schulkopf, Elements of Causal Inference which I will abbreviate ECI in the following, yeah? And all the figures, if not otherwise noted, are from this book just copied, okay? Also the reasoning is copied from the book, but sometimes I add something so that I also understand it, so that sometimes something is added. Um, so first of all now we will just look why we need additional assumptions, right? It might be clear already by now, but I will reiterate it, that's important. Um, and then we will look at um, theory and methods, basically there's always a theory where people prove something, some asymmetry yeah, that they can show in a joint distribution under certain assumption, and then how it could be exploited by an algorithm to decide whether x implies y or y implies x. Okay? And there's uh, four different methods that we look at. We look at the Linga method, the additive noise models, the information geometric causal inference, and the trace method. And they are really like a potpourri of ideas. So they are very disconnected and there's no big structure. So there are many more possibilities to have assumptions down here. So this is far from a complete theory. And these methods are, I think this one, the oldest one, I think is from 2006, and the other ones are, are really newer. Until then, people were thinking that it's not possible to infer the causal direction just from two variables. And as I show, you can't, but the interesting question is, under which mild assumptions can I do it? So that's the interesting question, right? And hopefully we shed some light on these questions. Okay, so let's first start with the first point. Why do we need additional assumptions? Um, so suppose uh, I have a joint distribution, px, y, where it doesn't matter in which order I now wrote x and y, right? It's symmetric, so it doesn't matter, yeah? Then in, in theory now, I want to infer, yeah, and I will need assumptions, whether the, the true structural causal model x error y or the other way around created my joint distribution. Yeah? So sometimes I can infer it from the joint distribution under certain assumption. In practice, we are given a data set, okay? So I'm, the joint distribution is like the idealized data set, like I would have infinite amount of data, but in practice, typically I have finitely many data points and then I want to do the inference as well. And in books and papers, the latter is sometimes called the population case. So here I'm having a population of finite examples. However, often it's interesting first to look at the theoretical case. So 
if my method doesn't make sense for the joint distribution, there's no chance that the data can tell me something about it. Okay. Of course, there are now these, um, uh, these consistency questions. What if the data goes to infinity? Will my estimators go to the right solution and all these things? And typically, the papers will discuss it. Yeah? Some do, some don't. Um, today, we won't. We will just look at the theoretical point that is made, and I show it very sketchy. Yeah? And then I show you a simple implementation of it, how to do it. Uh, Pseudo code. So there will be exercises on implementing these methods. So you should have some notebook. Unfortunately, I think not this week. I think we still have a couple of questions, but I will discuss with Sebastian what, what's the best order. I, actually, it would be nice to have this week the one, the implementation of these methods that would fit very well. Okay, first, why are additional assumptions needed? Okay, so suppose I have a structural causal model in one direction. Yeah, um, then this model entails a certain probability distribution function, right? That just follows from some transform transformation formulas that that's the case. Now, given the joint, yeah, and forgetting about the structural causal model, can I also now define a structural causal model the other way around, yeah? And the answer is yes. I pose the question differently, that's why there's a no, okay? So the question that I'm given here, if I know it's in one direction, no, no, given just the joint, can I infer that it's one direction and can I exclude the other direction? And the answer is no. Okay, and the proof will be given a structural causal model in one direction with a joint PDF, yeah, I show you how to define a structural causal model into the other direction. And then the next steps will be that I will discuss assumptions that are additionally made so that we suddenly have this asymmetric situation. Okay, here's a pro proposition. So for any joint PDF, there exists a structural causal model from X to Y with all the nice fancy properties written down here, okay? In particular, there exists one from X to Y and one from Y to X. Maybe this is not so cleverly written down because this is like PXY, but the order of X and Y in the joint density really doesn't matter, okay? So it's also, I could also apply the theorem and I would get a structural causal model from Y to X. Okay, with the same construction. Let's look uh, at the proof. So basically we're doing things that you've seen already. I think I did the calculation last time on the board. So the idea is just, if I have a joint PDF, then basically all my conditional PDFs are also defined in my idealized computer science world. Everything is fine, everything exists. Okay, and that allows me to define a conditional um, cumulative distribution function, where the cumulative distribution function that you know of maybe is just this p of y less than or equal to little y, but no one stops you from conditioning on another event, okay? And it just translates into using a different density function at the end, okay? So that's so far so simple. So that is my conditional CDF. Then I take the inverse um, of that one, which in general I have to write as an infimum, Okay, because the um, uh, CDF can be constant and then the inverse is not defined, so I take the smallest number as the answer, like last time, and this is de defining me a transformation. And now the curious thing here is it's a function of x and n, y. Okay, um, I want to have a noise variable at the end, and as you know, by choosing a uniform distribution here and then defining a particular transformation, exactly that one, I'm getting samples from a given distribution, and that's exactly the construction that I'm doing here. However, what about the little x over here that is the second input to my transformation? Because for a structural causal model, I need to define a function that takes an x and the noise variable for the y. That appears down here. That's basically the sub-index. It's a little x. Let's check back where it came from. So that is a conditional CDF, and it's conditioned on a particular value for little x. Okay, so this in principle is a function of y and I can invert it in terms of y, but the whole construction is also a function in little x. Okay, and that's where I then get my transformation from. So the little x is choosing one particular conditional CDF and then the ny is basically from a uniform distribution and it gets basically um, put into the quantile function of the conditional distribution. So it's the same construction as before, 
Just one level more complicated. So far so good? I hope so. Otherwise, please ask. So the other random noise variable is just the x. So it's just the p sub x, the marginal distribution that can be used for the other noise variable. The ny is the uniformly distributed variable, and it gets transformed using the conditional CDF to generate just the right distribution. OK? And as you can see, I can swap the roads of x and y. I could equally say, OK, my noise variable for y is just the variable y, and the nx is constructed in this manner. Uh, the nx is uniformly, and my transformation is constructed in this manner to compute an x. So nothing stops me from doing it the one way or the other way. And in the simple example last time with the, with the router, I don't know what it's in English. And does anyone know what router is? So this shape that we had on the board. A kite? Is there a kite? No. OK, whatever. It's, it's this parallelogram. It's a parallelogram. Yeah, it is also in German a parallelogram, yes. So a parallelogram. You remember this distribution? And we derived uniform distribution and some weird distribution for the y. And if we would have spent more on the whiteboard, we could have also generated the conditional distribution of x given y, which is getting really complicated to calculate, but it's possible. Is it an exercise on the exercise sheets? I'm not sure. It is. It's somewhat painful, but it's doable. It's all simple Ivers and Brackets stuff. OK, so you always can do it both ways. So if we don't have additional assumptions, there's no chance to infer it. OK? So now here comes the additional assumption. The assumption is the mechanism and the cause should be independent. And that is a very non-mathematical assumption. So that is not saying uh, this joint distribution factorizes or something. This is more about, I'm talking about the mechanism, which is this function, this assignment, yeah, that function should be independent of the cause, which is a random variable. So I have a function f, which is generating the effect, the deterministic computer program, and the random variable, the cause, the x, for example, they should be independent. However, this notion of independence is not mathematically defined. Okay? And today we will see approximations to it, so ideas that kind of do something like that. But it's far from being defined. There are papers from Dominic Jansing and Schulkopf and the other colleagues um, where they're using Kolmogorov complexity to try to make it more specific. Kolmogorov complexity is a topic from information theory, like Shannon's entropy stuff. And there's also a subchapter on Kolmogorov complexity. And that can be used as well to talk about the mechanism should be independent of the cause. And that's also a valid possibility how to do it. <coughs> So more formally, if we try to do it somewhat more formally, yeah, then we would like to say that the conditional density, let's write it p of the effect given the cause, and the marginal distribution p of c, they should be independent. But this is now independence on, the on one level up. It's not an independence on the random variables. It's an independence that kind of the the expression for the conditional distribution, right, with Ivers and brackets and blah, 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 blah. So this thing carries some information, right, how it's implemented or how it's generating data. And this mechanism shouldn't tell you anything about how the other data is generated. OK. As an example, for, let's say I, I take a picture of you with my cell phone like this, and unfortunately, I shake a bit because there's not enough light, OK? Then somehow this shake, this transformation here, is a mechanism how to manipulate the image that comes in, OK? So there's a true image, and it gets manipulated by this shake. Now the image has nothing to do with the shape that I'm, with the shake that I'm doing. So I'm not really doing a shake that's just matching your heads or something. I'm doing a shake for different reasons, OK? And so those are also two mechanisms that have nothing to do with each other. So the image content has nothing to do with the way I'm shaking my image. So that's some other examples. Of course, I could tweak my shake in such a way to take an image of you, but then to produce something very special that only works if everyone sits like you're sitting right now. Okay? But that's very unlikely to happen. 
So here comes the first message that is using the idea of that the mechanism is independent of the cause, but um, yeah, I will pinpoint to the location where this assumption is holding. But so this is the first method. So and it, the me these methods they are always proposed like that. First, I def define this assumption. Yeah, so here, here's the definition for an assumption that a joint distribution could additionally fulfill. And then there will be a theorem that you can then prove under this assumption. And the theorem always says there is now some asymmetry between x error y and y error x. Okay, so that is the pattern. So, first statement, if our joint distribution um, can, oh, let's rephrase it. So we would say the joint distribution yeah, admits a linear additive model yeah, from x to y in case there exists an alpha and a noise variable such that the y can be just written as a linear transformation of x plus noise. Okay, so that is a alarm model. However, additionally, we need an ind independence between the noise variable that we add to the y and my variable x. So some of the y has two parts here. So one part is coming from the x, and that's a random variable, and the other part is coming from some noise variable. And this split should be in such a way that the information from here isn't telling us anything about the information on the other side, and vice versa. Okay, that is introducing now some asymmetry, ideally. So where you see the independence assumption. So this assumption over here is an independence assumption, and it suggests at least some independence between my random variable x so also the density of x and the conditional distribution of y, okay, um, given x. Because the um, conditional distribution y and x, basically the randomness in here comes from my noise variable over there, okay. Once the x is fixed, yeah, the distribution here is only random because I'm adding some noise to it, right. If the x is given, there's a function to calculate the y, it's just alpha times x. So there's no randomness anymore coming from the x. And so those two parts, they should be independent. And it's somewhat expressed back here. Okay, what can we prove? So we can prove the following theorem. So if a joint distribution yeah, admits such a lamb, yeah, so if it is coming from such a lamb, if it admits a lamb in one direction, yeah, then the following two statements are equivalent. Okay, it's all a little bit a mind twister. So there exists a backward lamb, yeah? That means there's also a beta and another random variable, so that the whole thing holds backwards. Actually, that's what we want to exclude. However, the statement says this is equivalent to the next statement, that the noise variable ny and the variable x are both Gaussian. Okay, interesting. So that now means if one of them is non-Gaussian, yeah, and the joint distribution admits alarm in one direction, then the backward model cannot be possible anymore. Okay, so if I have a forward model, as defined up here, and there's this non-Gaussian stuff happening, in that case, the backward one doesn't work anymore. Okay, that's surprising that that's the case. Um, <coughs> So we could now say the structural causal model x to y is identify, identifiable if random variable x or the noise variable for y are non-Gaussian. Okay, so that's what we can conclude from the theorem. So far, so good. Okay, two implies one. I wrote it simple, but actually it's not so simple. Um, and I, the stuff that I wrote on the slide here is not sufficient to understand it. Um, I will look it up. And if I don't, so please remind me, okay? However, I can show you how the first implies the second one. So again, let's see what it was. So if I do have a forward LAM model and there exists a backward LAM model, then one can show that those two random variables are indeed Gaussian. Okay, so that's possible to show. Um, it sounds a bit like magic. So if you have a forward linear model and a backward linear model, and these independencies, then you can show that something is Gaussian distribution, distributed. That's very surprising. Um, what we will use is some big hammer. So we use a theorem from Damois Skitovic. So this is basically doing the work, and we are only applying it. 
So the theorem says the following, if I have two independent random variables, okay, and suppose there exists like a couple of coefficients that are non-zero, such that there are two, um, there are linear combinations of A and B, and another linear combination of A and B, and they are independent. Okay, if these coefficients exist, in that case, A and B are Gaussian distributed. Okay, that's a deep theorem. That is very non-trivial, and I don't know the proof. And of course, you can generalize it for n variables and make it more complicated, but this is the simplest instance. Okay, now you might think, so, but what if I choose alpha 1 equal to alpha 2, beta 1, be, beta, beta 1 being equal to beta 2? That doesn't help you, because in that case, um, this random variable is the same as the one on the other side. So they will never be independent of each other. Yeah, so if I have these coefficients, the coefficients will be different from each other. And they must be non-trivial, okay? Otherwise, we will never have this independence. So now, what does it mean? It means, basically, you have a, um, two random variables, A and B, and somehow you can linearly combine them, and you get something else which is independent of each other, yeah? And that happens only for Gaussian distribution. So that is this theorem. So now, how can we use it? Okay, let's assume now, for the forward direction, we have alarm, okay, with the independence, and for the backward direction, we have also this alarm, okay, with the other independence. So, let's get started. So, x and ny will play the roles of a and b in the theorem, okay, so x will be a and ny will be b. So, first of all, a and b must be independent, so that's given. Yeah, from the assumption that we have a LAR model and Y and X are independent of each other. Next, what we have to construct is we have to construct this independence over here and that is constructed by, I think, taking this one as a starting point and then plugging this expression in. So let's do that. So we start with the independence of N sub X is independent of Y, okay, and then we plug an expression for the NX in here. So the NX is basically... Um, x minus beta y, so this is x minus beta y, where I plugged in another expression for the y. Okay, so that is the expression that I have for the y. So far so good. So that is the left-hand side of this independence. What about the right-hand side of the independence? There's also a y, where I plugged in the, some expression for the y. Okay, so far so good. Now if I do a little bit of reshuffling, yeah, if I drag out the x, then I have 1 minus beta alpha times x minus beta and this noise variable is independent of alpha x plus ny. And here we have now our coefficient alpha 2, beta 2, and this minus beta is beta 1, and this 1 minus beta alpha is alpha 1. Okay, so we've shown now two linear combinations which are independent of each other. And then comes Damois, Skitovic, that says, okay, everyone must be Gaussian. Everyone in the room is Gaussian. Okay, otherwise this is not possible. Okay, so that's the proof from 1 to 2. And unfortunately, the proof from 2 to 1 is not as simple as I thought. So I have to think about it more. Okay, so what have we shown now? We have shown now that if we have a forward and a backward model, yeah, in that case, like this noise variable and the x, also the ny and the x must be Gaussian distributed. In particular, that means if they, one of them is not Gaussian distributed, yeah, then the alarm can only be valid in one direction. So this is all very different reasoning from what I've seen so far in mathematics. So this is really somehow some clever stuff. Maybe I should study statistics here in Dortmund and then this would be trivial. But this is really beyond the stuff that I've seen in textbooks. So this is really something new. And it's was developed in the last 20 years. So this is really quite interesting di directions now. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so we can also state all this differently. Um, oh, now here's an, is another model. So that was the first one. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, let's say a joint distribution admits a linear non-Gaussian additive model, the Linga model, x to y. And that holds if I have a linear model for the forward direction, yeah, and x or and y are non-Gaussian. Okay, that's another stronger assumption. Before we didn't have this 
red part here. We only had the linear additive model, only the LAM part. Now we have the NG part in here, which is over here. Okay, the NG part. And if I have that one, then it follows from the previous theorem that if I'm having a linear model in one direction, yeah, then the structural causal model x to y is identifiable. Okay. Or, with other words, the backward direction cannot be modeled by a linear equation. That's another way to state this. Here's an example, again, from the ECI book. So here's a, this joint distribution that we had before, the parallelogram. And um, the blue line is basically modeling the direction y is equal to some alpha times x. Okay, And the other direction is modeled by the red line. So that's basically now a function for all points of y, that's why the red line is starting over here at 1.5 in this case, because the red line is defined for all possible values of y. Okay? And the output will be the x. And that is the red line. Similarly, for the blue line, it's defined where the x is defined. And now what can we see? So let's first take y being equal to alpha times x plus some noise. And now we need to check whether the noise and y and the x are independent of each other. So the distribution of the x is a uniform distribution and the noise y is basically the noise that you get when you are at a particular location and it's also uniformly distributed and they are independent of each other. So the x doesn't tell you anything where we are here vertically. Okay, so I don't know anything about it. Let's go the other way around. The other way around I would have x equals to some beta times y plus some noise variables here. And now, again, now we need to check whether the y yeah, is independent of the noise on the x. Okay? And for that, basically, we also... So how did we do it the other way around? I said, okay, let's say x equals 0. We have all these possibilities for y, which is uniformly distributed, and it's always the same distribution. If I do it the other way around, I could, for example, say y is equal to 1, so I'm having this gray area here, yeah? and it is also uniformly distributed, but the variance changes depending on where on the y-axis I am. When I'm up here on the y-axis, yeah, the gray part is much smaller, and when I'm in the middle, the gray part is much larger. So the variance of this noise distribution and x depends on my location where I am for the y. So the y and the nx are dependent on each other. Okay. Hence the asymmetry. So far so good? Maybe. Okay, here comes the algorithm. That was the theory with some little hole in the proof. So here's the, the algorithm. So we have some data, some finitely many data points. And suppose we assume a linear additive model, then we can also write the whole situation as a matrix, okay? Well, let me write down how the matrix looks like, then it's easier. So, the matrix, um, or maybe I should should write it out, so now let, let me again go to the iPad and this, kind, this time hopefully write something more meaningful than last time. Um, okay, the starting point might be that I say, um, Let's say I'm having y is equal to alpha blah plus this one, okay, and the x is equal to <coughs> my noise. So now if I would write it as a matrix multiplication, I would have x and y, put it into a vector. Then I also have an x and y on the other side of the equation. And then I have the noise. And now the question is, what is the matrix that I need to put in here? And this matrix that I need to put in here is for the y, I need an alpha in front of the x, okay, and a zero in front of the y. And then I have y is equal to alpha times x plus zero times y plus the noise. And for the x, I want to have only zeros up here. Okay, now I can bring it to the other side, okay, and I can say uh, another way to write this is uh, suppose here I'm writing the identity matrix in front. I can always do that. And then I have basically the identity matrix minus. 
the special matrix where there's a lonely alpha in there. And the difference of those gets multiplied with the vector x, y. And that is equal to my noise variables. OK, and this now, that is the matrix that we've seen on the slide. I show you on the slide. So that is exactly the matrix that we have. And the curious thing is by looking at the location of the alpha, I either have that x is the source and y is the effect, or the other way around if I have a beta on the other side. So what have I written up here? So assuming a LA model may, means basically I have a linear additive model. So there is such a matrix yeah, to write the vector x, y as linear combinations of the noise. Yeah? That's just because the noise is additive and I'm having a linear model. Yeah? So in principle, I can plug in the x into the equation for the y, and then I get these coefficients. Now, just by finding this matrix and looking for the right zero, where the zero is, I can now identify the direction. And this can be done by ICA. I'm not sure. Have you ever heard of ICA? Yes, no? Who have heard of ICA? No one. OK. So ICA is a method that is somewhat like PCA. Have you heard of PCA? Principal Component Analysis. Um, so in, I draw a picture for you. So PCA. What it's doing, for example, is you have a cloud of points. OK, so this is a 2D point cloud, x1 and x2. And then PCA will give you the main direction. I can also use a different color, so let's be fancy. So this is the main direction. And it will give you the direction of largest variance. OK, that's the first direction that you get. And um, the second direction is in a, at a right angle to the first one. And it gives you the direction of the second largest variance. And that could be super useful if, let's say, you are in 100 dimensional space, but the data actually is in some three dimensional sub blob. Then PCA would give you exactly these three directions, and the other ones can be ignored. OK, so it's a nice way also to compress data or something like that to get rid of information. OK, now what is ICA? Um, ICA is doing something similar. Um, However, let's again look what's happening up here. So this will find directions that are then uncorrelated. Yeah? Uncorrelatedness here basically means that they are in a right angle to each other. In ICA, you get directions that are independent of each other. So here, this is about correlations. And in ICA, we do something similar about independence. So when can you do it? Typically, when the data is non-Gaussian. So let's have non-Gaussian data here. So this is some non-Gaussian data. Yeah, so this is a non-Gaussian distribution. It's definitely not Gaussian, right? What could it be? What this, this distribution could be the following. So suppose here's a zero point, and here's a zero point. Then this thing could be an audio signal, yeah? samples from an audio signal. And this is a sample from another audio signal. Yeah, so suppose you have two microphones, and then in one microphone, I'm speaking with a certain loudness, and the other one picks me up as well, but softer. And another person is also speaking, and the other microphone maybe gets more information of the other one, but both are kind of mixed. Then the X1 is what first microphone measures, and X2 is what the second microphone measures. And now ICA can identify these directions here. And by this, separate the two audio sources, ideally. OK? And the curious thing here is the assumption, um, so let's make it a bit more mathematically. So we have x1, x2, and it's a vector. And we assume it's a mixed version of two other signals, s1, s2, where we assume that the joint distribution of s1 and s2 is factorizing. So they are independent of each other. OK. And now we are looking for a matrix that is um, demixing the data in such a way that the, the resulting signals are independent of each other, statistically independent. And that is 
ICA in a nutshell. Whereas in PCA, the only thing we are doing, we are trying to make the things uncorrelated. So this is just a decorrelation method. And this is an, yeah, okay, there's no translation for decorrelation like this one. Okay, so that is ICA. So ICA is able to find a mixing matrix such that the resulting signals get independent. And that's exactly what we need because the assumption is that the noise X and Y are independent of each other. So we can apply ICA to identify this matrix A. Okay. And so all you need is an implementation of ICA and then you can run it if the assumptions are right that you have a linear model here. Okay. There are many more details. Uh, there's a paper from Shim Shimizu, JMLR, 2006. So that's where there are more details about this. Okay. Um, let's step back. So what was the big thing here? The big thing is if you know that one direction is a linear model, a linear additive model, where the linearity is here about the prefactor, so it's just a linear transformation of some other variable, and additive meaning that the noise is additive, okay? In that case, yeah, if some distributions are non-Gaussian, then the direction is identifiable. Okay, so that's a special thing. But you see the assumptions are numerous and quite strong, right? So why should it be linear, the relationship between x and y? That might be a complete toy, okay? However, that's very often the case if people um, apply a linear linear regression model, so where basically I'm fitting a linear function between variables like in mediation analysis or these kind of things in social sciences, they very often assume linear additive models yeah, and fit the coefficients there. So it's not so far-fetched to do this. Okay, so far so good. That was our first method. And okay, it assumes that you know what ICA is. But um, as I said, it's like PCA, but not decorrelating the data, but making it independent. Okay, let's get to the next one. So the nonlinear additive models. So it says all already, right? Nonlinear now means I have a nonlinear function, and additive means the noise is additive. So here it is. We say that a, a joint distribution admits an additive noise model yeah, if there is some function f sub y and a random variable ny with basically the same equation as before and basically the same independence assumption as we had also on the previous slides. Okay, so the x, the input, should be independent of the noise that gets added. And again, here the independence of the noise for y and the random variable x, they, it suggests some form of independence between these distributions. So it's this, this, uh, this um, independence between the mechanism and the margin distribution. So here's the theorem. Um, luckily, here only one implies two and no equivalence. Maybe I should check whether I really need the other direction and then maybe I can drop it and I don't have to prove it. And if I don't have to prove it, or it, since I couldn't prove it, maybe it's, it's a good sign if it's wrong, right? So otherwise it's so frustrating, yeah. Okay, but here only one implies two. If my joint distribution also admits an additive noise model the other way around, so there must be some nonlinear function g, yeah, so that the x is g of y plus some noise, in that case, we have this very weird looking statement. In that case, the marginal distribution Px is determined by three numbers that can be calculated from the noise distribution and from the function. So this is super technical and super strange. Yeah? Um, but that's like the simplest form that they have right now for this setup. And I think they, this three number thing, that's like a weird thing. Um, it can be translated as follows. It basically means that the marginal Px must be fine-tuned to the nonlinearity and to the noise variable if you want to have an additive noise model in both directions. With fine-tuned means, yes, you can find a distribution for x where it just works with a given Fy and a certain noise distribution, but typically if the distribution of Px has nothing to do with the mechanism, yeah, it's very unlikely that this will happen, that the distribution of the x is just fine-tuned that in this unfortunate event, both directions are possible. By the way, this is already the simplified statement. 
I think the real statement from Jonas Peters' book is even more complicated. It's something about second derivatives and it's some differential equation stuff that you apply on these things. So you see, this is somewhat, it feels a bit unpolished because it's very new stuff. Yeah? So it could be that maybe in 20 years, yeah, someone else comes with a more general theory and then this will drop out as a special case and one will understand why there's this weird property here. But so far, this is already something, yeah, it's something useful because if we have an additive noise model, then in principle, yeah, we can, we can infer the causal direction, which was unknown before, like 20 years ago. People were thinking with two variables, you have no chance, okay? However, it's a bit technical, this thing down here. Um, so, as I said, typically, if my joint distribution admits an additive noise metal in one direction, it does not an additive noise metal in the other direction. Only for pathological examples, it also works both sides. Okay? So here's a pathological example. Of course, they try to come up with one. So, um, those are two non-identifiable examples. First of all, um, where's the additional assumption here? Yeah, okay. So that's a Gaussian case, and um, that's a linear Gaussian case. Basically, you can do any direction you want. It doesn't matter. So it's symmetric. But this is a non trivial one for the nonlinear function. So you could have one function like that. That is again from x to y, and the red one is the function from y to x. And the density that is plotted here, this black stuff, that is a fine tuned density such that we will have an additive noise model in both directions. Okay, so this black density is fine-tuned towards this red function here, so to admit an additive noise model in both directions. But it's a pathological case that probably you won't see in, in practice. Okay, let's look at a slightly nicer case. So there's also a Gaussian additive noise model, and the Gaussian additive noise model assumes that now, ny and x are Gaussian, okay? That's a bit confusing because in the lingam we were explicitly assuming that we were non-Gaussian. So now what changed here? So here we departed from the linear Gaussian model not by saying the noise variables are non-Gaussian, but by saying the linear function is not a linear function. It's non-linear. So from this linear additive model where we assume the noise variables and everything is Gaussian, and the function is linear, there you can't show anything, but you can depart either by saying the noise variables are non-Gaussian, or you could say, I'm having a non-linear function. And when you think about it, once you apply a non-linear function to a Gaussian distribution, it's non-Gaussian. Okay, so in this case, y will be non-Gaussian if the f is a non-linear function, right? Because Gaussians are only close under linear um, transformations. Okay, under this Gaussian additive noise model assumption, the theorem is now nicer. So um, if I have a Gaussian additive noise model in both directions, oh no, only in one direction, and an additive noise model in the other direction, in that case one can show that the function is already linear. Okay, so the case where you cannot, do, cannot show anything for x implies y or y implies x is the case. You have linear functions and you have Gaussian noise variables, right? And the Gaussian noise variables imply together with the linear functions that x and y are also Gaussian. And then if you depart from this one, either by saying I have non-Gaussian noise variables or by saying I have a non-linear function, then you can show something. By the way, that might also hint why is it only discovered like in the last 20 years? Because many things are Gaussian in statistics. So lots of the theory is, is for Gaussian distribution. And um, the, this ICA idea, for example, it only works for non-Gaussian distribution. So it's kind of linked to this causality ideas, but somewhat older, okay? But the ICA was also first looking like a magic trick that you can do it. It was very surprising. Um, but then people understood, oh, looks like the non-Gaussian distributions are super interesting and there are some things possible that we never thought of because we always only looked at Gaussian distributions. And so for the causality, something similar is happening. In particular, we can even use ICA. Okay, let's use causal learning based on the 
additive noise model and not the Gaussian additive noise model, but the more general one, which typically is fine. Okay, so how does the algorithm look like? We are given some data set. We apply some nonlinear regression to fit a function f and g. Okay, it could be also linear regression with some basis functions. The key is that the f is a nonlinear function. So we can do it in both directions, of course, right? So you can swap input and output. And then you test for, ident uh, for the independency. So you can check the residual of y minus f of x is the noise in y. And you check it whether it's independent of the input x. And you can do it also for the other situation, check the residuals against the input y. And then you say, OK, which is more independent? Which gets a larger H6 score, OK? Or smaller? I think a smaller one. And that is the one where you say that is the direction of independence. OK, what are the benchmarks for such um, methods? Those are exactly the ones that you had in the first exercise sheet, these pairs model. Uh, these pairs data sets from the tubing pairs data set. So they are designed particular to test these kind of methods to see whether they are better than chance. Because if the statement is true, it's impossible for two variables, then no matter what method you devise, it should be 50-50. So you should be only, it should be better than random guessing on the tubing pairs data set. However, they can show that they are higher than 50%. They are 70 or 80%, which is not perfect. So there are still work to do. Okay, again, this is um, the same example as before. Maybe I should put this plot earlier already. So this is like the fit from x to y, and this is again the fit from y to x. Okay, it's the same plot as before. And then this is plotting now the residual. So this is x against the residual of y of x, and you see that it's like nice two uniform distributions that factor nicely. And here you see y, y on this axis, and you see how the, the spread depends on the value of y. Okay, this plot already fits also on the previous one that I, where I put the plot. So far so good. So those are the additive noise models. Where's machine learning now? Oh, we can use machine learning here in this step here. We can do whatever we want for the nonlinear regression, okay? You can run a neural network or you can run a support vector regression or whatever you like, okay? That's maybe why these methods were developed in the lab for machine learning. So these, the lab is at the Max Planck Institute in Tübingen for Bernhard Schulkopf, where Dominic Jansing and Jonas Peters worked at that time. And they developed these methods, but coming from the machine learning perspective. Okay, so that's maybe why maybe a normal statistician would never do put a neural network here or do things like that, or at least they wouldn't have done it 20 years ago. Maybe now it's getting more standard. Why, why don't they prefer not to work with neural networks? Because for neural networks, you cannot prove anything, right? Or you can, you can try to do, but it's very hard because it's like a very complicated function, a very complicated way to parameterize stuff. And you have many, many parameters, which is also disturbing that you can estimate them at all, okay? So that's why some things might get um, found out outside of the statistics community because the computer scientists might be fearless to just try it, and they see, oh yes, we see the asymmetry, and we can also see it on the data sets. And we don't care so much for the proofs yet. Actually, that's an exaggeration. When you look at the papers, there are lots of proofs. Yeah, so they, are, they try to make it really waterproof what they, what they propose. Okay, yet another one. So here's the information geometric. Okay, question before we go on. Yes, so this corresponds to that equation, right? It's the residual corresponding to this fit. And um, for the additive noise model, the ad additional thing was that we say x must be in independent of the noise variable. And that corresponds to this statement. So an H6 score typically measures how independent two random variables are. And let's say the score is larger if they are more independent, then it basically means which of the H, so if I apply the H to this situation and I get some score, 
and I can apply the H stick to the other way around, and I get another score, and I would say the one with the larger score is the correct direction. The thing is, in the population case, having only finite amount of data, both scores will say, yeah, they are somewhat independent, but maybe, or they are somewhat dependent. But the question is, which is less dependent, basically? So both will be showing some dependence here because of finite amount of data, but the question is, which are less dependent? Yeah. Okay. But with the larger or smaller, it depends on the method that you're using, whether it's, so here now it says, more independent means larger score. But I'm not sure whether the h is implemented like that. Maybe the h six should be zero or something if it's independent. Any more questions? Okay, let's look at yet another completely different way of thinking about this, at so-called information geometry causal inference. Information geometry, by the way, is a topic developed from Shunichi Amari, it's some Japanese researcher. He's already old, so he developed this in the 70s and 80s. And like he's a really big name in neural networks, actually, in signal processing. But he is a statistician by heart, I think. And he always also discusses things like convergence properties and consistency and this kind of stuff. And so he looked at probability distribution through a geometric eye, okay? Let me just briefly show you what information geometry is. Like, it's another thing I haven't worked out before. But basically, in information geometry, in for, oh, maybe I shouldn't try to write on this one. So in information geometry, IG. One is probably asking the question, so suppose I'm looking at the space of all Gaussian distributions, okay? So let's look at the space of all distributions with two parameters, univariate Gaussian distributions, okay? So X is distributed according to such a distribution. And now, how do I visualize it? I have a mean, and the mean could be anything on the real line, and I have a standard deviation, and so the standard deviation must be a positive number. So it's only this half space yeah, that corresponds to all Gaussian distributions. Now the question is, if I have one point here, that corresponds to a Gaussian distribution, and I could have another point here, and I have another distribution. Now let's say I'm having an optimization algorithm yeah, where I'm kind of try to try to want to learn these two things and I'm whatever I'm having the case iteration the k plus one iteration is in some update with some learning rate and some gradient and blah 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 okay so I have some optimization algorithm which is trying to improve that one now the question is what is the natural geometry on this space okay so what is for example, the distance between these points. So what's the natural way to define distances here? And the curious thing is that in this space, one shouldn't use the Euclidean distance, but in this space, one should use some other distance. So the whole space is curved. So this is um, Riemannian geometry. So this is basically differential geometry. So I can define on each spot, I can define some tensor which would describe what the right metric would be, okay? So this gets really mathematical, that's why it's called geometry, okay? And it's about what is a good distance measure between two random distributions, for example. And as it turns out, the right one to use is the KL diversions, okay? So that is one which makes the most sense. And then in, this, in the language of differential geometry, it can be shown that the KL diversion is an alpha divergence and it has certain properties and there's even a, a theorem of Pythagoras for the KL diversions and many fancy things. So some new insights really. And um, it's beyond what I know since I don't know differential geometry very much. So this is all my party knowledge I have about it, okay? But it's, if you are into mathematics very much, it could be interesting to see information geometry. This topic might be a nice application of it, okay? And it's, it's quite fancy. So what does it buy you? 
it buys you to put some matrix in here, so in front of the, um, the tensor. And so instead of using the normal gradient, which is more using Euclidean geometry, yeah, instead you should use the information geometry here. And by putting a tensor here, you are more naturally going through the space. And then certain convergence proofs are nicer and certain convergences are also much faster. And so you get also new algorithms. So instead of doing gradient descent, you will get a new method called natural gradient. And so the natural gradient means that you plug in basically the, the Riemannian, Riemannian tensor in here, so the, some, some tensor that describes the local geometry. You put it in front of the gradient, and it will distort the space in such a way that you go into a more clever direction. Okay? This is super fancy. If you don't care so much for the math, the algorithm is quite nice. Yeah, sometimes it can be computed. It plays a role in reinforcement learning and in some other areas. Also in ICA, by the way. There's, of course, also a nat natural gradient method. Um, I think there's a paper from Trunici Amari, something like natural gradient works for learning. And there he shows a couple of examples. It's quite a short paper. And there he explains the method and why it works. But there's a big book on information geometry as well. Maybe there would be a nice lecture too to go through the book. And then maybe in a small lecture like this, without recording, then we could go through the whole thing. So this is now information geometry causal inference. Now, do we have to know information geometry to understand it? Luckily not. Yeah? Luckily, it's also some weird combination of ideas that you ideally or possibly never have seen before. However, it has an interpretation in information geometry. That's why it's interesting. And that's why it got this name. Okay. So again, the question is, how can we measure or describe independence between the mechanism and the input data distribution? Okay, And now in, in this IGCI approach, we are looking at a special setup. So we have no noise. So we say there's a deterministic relationship between x and y. Okay, And this function must be invertible. Otherwise, it's boring anyway. Okay, so we have some invertible function between x and y, so it's very special and very limited. Okay, um, the curious thing is now, in this case, under this assumption, the independence of the mechanism at the cause can be reduced to an independence between the marginal distribution x, the density, and the function f. And this can be made mathematically, uh, it can be expressed with a mathematical expression. So we can really have an independence between a function and a density, which is, I think, new, at least to me, at least in my brain. Curiously, if we assume an independence between this density and this function, one can show that there's a dependence between the situation the other way around. So it's about the inverse of f, and it's about py. OK? And again, this is quite surprising. So. Um, first of all, here's a special case. So let's say the input density is a uniform distribution. Okay, that's a simple case. It's in the interval 0 to 1. And the function f is a diffeomorphism with some inverse g. So what was a diffeomorphism? Diffeomorphism is just a differentiable function f that has a differentiable inverse. That's it. That's a diffeomorphism. Okay. Um, now, Using the transformation formula, we can calculate the density, the marginal distribution of y. And how are we doing this? OK, the, we have a deterministic function. Yeah, let's call the inverse g. Yeah, then by the transformation formula, yeah, the p of y is just the p of x where I plug in the g of y times the derivative of my inverse function located as y. And then with the same reasoning as before, I can omit this term. Right? Why? Because it's a uniform distribution and it's constant to 1, at least on the interval 0 to 1, where I'm interested in. OK, so now you see already where we are heading. We have a density here, and here we have a derivative of a function. And we wanted to have some independence between some density and a function, and that's like the first step towards this. First observation is, if I have peaks in my distribution y, it will correspond to steep slopes of g. So what do I mean by that? So this is an illustration from the paper of Daniusis, 
Um, that, that was, by the way, I think a summer intern or something, interning at the Max Planck Institute. And um, they came up with this idea. I, I think he came up together with the other one with this idea. And they wrote a paper for some international top tier conference, which was really amazing for, I think, for an intern being there like two months or so. So here's the story. So the PX is uniform. It's a straight line. The PY now has these bumps. And curiously, these bumps correspond exactly to the derivative of y, right? Why? So if, if I would have the identity function here, then y would be also uniform. However, by being sometimes a little bit more flat, yeah, I'm compressing the part from here to here. I'm compressing it into this little bump. Or similarly, here I'm very flat for a while, so I'm compressing all these points from the x-axis into one single location on the y-axis. So you see that the function f and the density of y are closely related. Yeah? More precisely, the density is really the derivative of the function g if I assume a uniform distribution for the x. Then one can derive this. Otherwise, it's the product of the density of x and the derivative. But you see there's a nice relationship between the derivative of my function and the density, yeah, which is quite surprising in my um, head. Now to measure independence, we are not measuring independence here, but correlation between a function and a density. How are we doing this? First of all, um, recall what a covariance is. Covariance between two random variables is basically the product of the deviation from their means. So you have x minus the mean of x and y minus the mean of y, and you multiply that and then average over the x. Again, note the ex is a constant. It's not random anymore. That is already a scalar. The ey is also already a scalar. So the only random stuff in here from perspective of the outer e is the x and the y over here. Notice that the covariance of x comma x is just the variance. Okay, so this is a nice generalization of the variance for two variables. And actually, those are the entries of the covariance matrix, the off-diagonal entries. Okay, if you have a random vector x on top of y, then the covariance here is, are exactly the off-diagonal entries. Okay, you can also use the usual tricks. You can rewrite it also as the expectation of the product and the product of the expectation. Again, this looks like innocent, but here's more in here. So the, the, the product of two variables is a nonlinear function, right? And so it doesn't commute with integration because integration is a linear operator. And so the covariance is exactly the mismatch between these interchange, yeah, somehow. But that's a bit hand wavy. Okay, now what can we do if we have functions? We could plug in um, some other random variables. So suppose I have two functions f and g and some random variables, then we get new random variables, right? And we can also now define the covariance of f of x and g of y to be the covariance of these new random variables applied to each other. Sure. Next, we can also take a canonical random variable, which is a, defined on the unit interval, just takes a uniform distribution. And this now allows us to define the covariance of two functions, which is something new, I think, beyond the things that you usually see. So by now, assuming, so my covariance between two functions is defined to be the covariance of plugging in the uniform distribution, okay? Quite interesting. Now comes, again, our definition. So a joint distribution admits the RGCI model in one direction. First of all, if there exists a strictly monotonic diffeomorphism, again, this is a fancy word for being an invertible function, being differentiable, and the inverse must be differentiable as well. So that's a diffeomorphism. Strictly monotonic means it's really growing, right? But I think it's already contained in being invertible somewhat. Um, furthermore, x should have a strictly positive PDF, so it should be really possible to reach every value between 0 and 1. That's also a technical assumption. And then my function f and my density are independent in the following sense. And this is now a mathematical way to write down the independence between the mechanism and the distribution. However, as you know, independence is more than correlation. And that what we are using here is more a correlation, right? 
So it's about a covariance. It's about some entry in the covariance matrix. So we are really defining it here in terms of a certain correlation. However, in a way, it's fine, right? If they are independent, then that will imply that they are also uncorrelated. However, there might be ways how log f prime is still dependent on px, and even though we have this equality being equal to zero. But let's not worry about it. So how can we pass this? Okay, so this is a function. Fine. We can plug in a uniform distribution. And the p sub x is also a function. We can also plug in a uniform distribution. Okay. So far, so good. We can also write this out. So the covariance here is now, um, um, the first one is just this integral, which looks like, okay, but where's the uniform distribution? The uniform distribution is just that we are integrating from 0 to 1, and we weight it with 1 that we omitted. Okay, so that's gone. And the uniform distribution, again, is we have certain bounds, and the density is equal to 1. And the same for the last one. Okay, so curiously, the px um, just turns out to be the usual expectation that we have. And this one will be 1, so it just disappears. Of course, this one can be calculated, and this one can be calculated possibly as well. Of course, if you have finitely many data points, you can approximate such an integration with a finite sum. Okay, okay so far so good. So this is how you could calculate it. Um, now comes the theorem. If my joint distribution admits an IGCI model in one direction, yeah, so that means this covariance is equal to zero, then the inverse will satisfy the following. The covariance is possibly zero, but usually larger, yeah, and we have equality only if my function f is the identity function. So only in the super boring case, yeah, f being the identity function, where everything is totally symmetric and it doesn't make sense to say one is the cause and the other one is the effect. Yeah, in this case, um, both are zero. Usually, the covariance in the opposite direction will be positive. Okay. Here's another visualization now for a different distribution. So this is a more complicated distribution, and the marginal distribution of y is now the product of this p of p sub x of the mapped values, or the inversely backmapped values, times the derivative of this function. Okay. But you, you will see here that this is such a big flat area that all this part from here to here gets compressed into a small region on the y. So that's why you see the bump. And here you nicely see the corresponding thing that the derivative of this function, of the inverse function, basically is very much correlated with the peaks in here, right? Because the inverse function is the one where you turn your head, where you mirror the whole thing. And there, the derivative of the inverse function is really large, right? So if f of x has a very flat area, it means that the inverse function has a very steep area. So the derivative is very large at a location where the density is also very large. Okay. Of course, I could tune the p of x. If I would make on this area, I could make it really small, the p of x. Yeah, then maybe you don't see a bump in here. But then we have tuned the mechanism and the input distribution, okay? And that is against the assumption. How can we do it now practically? So first of all, it's enough to look at this quantity here so that the first part of the um, covariance expression, so we can ignore the back part here. We only need the first part actually. And um, we can do it also for the other way around. And then there's a non-trivial thing. You can also show that one is minus the other. Okay, now the question is, which one is smaller? So that's basically it. So it can be derived from the assumption. Okay, and if the CXY is smaller than the other one, yeah, then basically we have an IGCI model in X to Y. And here's the algorithm. Basically just calculate this integration now and the derivative is just calculated by putting the differences to neighboring pixels. So you need to sort your data along the x-axis. Okay, this is giving you nice intervals, x1, x2, x3, x4. And then by taking the difference between the function values and the difference between the lengths of the intervals, we are very coarsely calculating here derivatives, okay, in a very basic manner. 
and you do it the other way around as well, which is like just swapping yeah, the fraction and calculating it the other way around, and then you are looking which one is smaller, and that's it. Okay, so far so good. There are some interesting things. So the idea first is amazing that you can do it with so few, few assumption kind of, right? Um, because this is really capturing really nicely that the mechanism is independent of the density. It's a nice way to capture this one. However, then the longer you chew on the method and you, you think about it, yeah, it turns out that um, the HEI, IGCI condition X error Y yeah, will imply that the entropy of X is greater or equal than the entropy of Y. And in that case, you can just use entropy estimators and you would say that Okay, the one with the uh, larger entropy is the effect, and the one with the uh, is the cause, and the one with the um, smaller entropy is the effect. Okay. However, that also sheds some light why we are not allowed to have noise because if I add noise to the output variable, I can arbitrarily manipulate the entropy of y. Okay, entropy is this measure of randomness. Have you heard of entropy? Yes. No. Oh, you all know entropy. That's awesome. That's great. Um, by the way, the entropy can be also written as the KL divergence to the uniform distribution, which is kind of curious. Yeah, and that kind of makes the link then to the rest of the series. This kind of insight here. Anyway, so um, if that's the problem of the IGCI method is that your observations must be noise-free, which in reality data never is, and then so. Uh, you never know whether you are really measuring what you want to measure or whether you're measuring the noise in this case. Okay, we have five minutes left. Maybe if I go five minutes over time, we can also have the fourth method, yeah? And then this chapter is closed. So here comes yet another way. So I think I didn't promise too much. The methods are really all very different and they're really all somehow very surprising ideas that they used. And here's yet another very surprising idea, which is again kind of orthogonal to the rest. It has, looks like it has nothing to do with the rest. For this, we first need to again repeat what was this covariance matrix stuff. Okay, so for univariate random variables, the covariance is just a single number, right? And as I said, if you plug in x and x, you get the variance. So far, so good. For multivariate random variables, the covariance is a matrix. Okay, we have a vector x in this case and a vector y and we get a D times E matrix. Or if we plug in the X twice, then basically we get um, the, the typical covariance matrix that we typically have, okay? But we can also have it for two different vectors. That's also possible. That was just a reminder. Let's get to the trace condition, okay? Again, we do some See some definitions where we again say a joint distribution satisfies a certain assumption and in that case we can show something. Okay, let's start. So now we are in high dimensional. Yeah? So far we typically talk about scalar random variables. That's where we typically can good, uh, do a good regression from one to the other and the other way around. Yeah? Or also the IGCI, was, everything was just univariate. The trace condition is now an idea that lives in a high dimensional space. So my one random variable is a d-dimensional vector. My other random variable is an e-dimensional vector, okay? And they satisfy a certain linear model. So there is a matrix that transforms one variable into the other plus some noise. Again, the noise should be independent of my random variables x. Okay, so far so good. Nothing more yet, no assumption on Gaussianity or anything. So far, that's not enough, right? So we need something additionally here. So now we say the joint distribution of X and Y satisfies a trace condition if the covariance matrix yeah, of my X, notice it's a vector, so there is a matrix, and this mixing matrix A are independent. So that's again an interesting statement. The covariance matrix that's like an instance that tells me something about the marginal distribution of X. So it's coming from the marginal distribution. Yeah? And I'm saying now the covariance matrix, which is describing the marginal distribution to some degree, that should be independent of the mechanism A. Okay? And now how is this independence now 
this time defined. It's about the trace. So basically it's saying the trace of my covariance matrix times the trace of A times A transpose, okay, should be equal to the trace of A times the covariance matrix mal A transpose, okay? Why is that interesting? Okay, let me try to briefly explain. I, I try not to go too much over time, so let me briefly explain it. So you know the trace of a matrix, right? That's just the summation of the diagonal entries. Okay, so far so good. Now what is the trace of A times B? Are there any nice rules for that one? Wouldn't it be nice to say, oh, that's just trace of A times trace of B, right? So that's like a typical rule. However, it's totally wrong, of course, right? Why? Because the trace is, again, some linear operator here. And so you cannot drag it to each of the factors. So this is something nonlinear, OK? So it's wrong. However, if the A and the B are like totally random matrix that have nothing to do with each other, then surprisingly, there are situations where this is right. Because the trace of A is also the sum of the eigenvalues, OK? And so the sum of the eigenvalues times the sum of the eigenvalues of another matrix, sometimes it is even equal to the sum of the eigenvalues of the product. However, only if A and B are kind of completely random from each other. It's, again, a weird idea, OK? And if we would have more time, I would try to try the statement maybe in a Jupyter notebook. Now, how is it written down here? It is almost looking like what I just said. However, up to one thing, notice here is a rule that holds, so trace A and B is equal to trace B times A. So in particular, if you have the trace ABC, you can rotate the matrices around. You might ask, okay, but what about the sizes, right? I mean, the size, the columns, number of columns of C must match the columns of A, the rows of A. Otherwise, this is not defined. However, trace is for squared matrices, right? So the outer dimension, so the number of rows must be equal to the number of columns. So it's fine. And you can rotate around these things without any, any problems. That corresponds to swapping the summation of the trace with the summation of the matrix matrix multiplication. That's basically the thing that's happening here. OK, so in a way, the A transpose is on the other side, and then this is more looking like what I just showed, showed to you. OK, and this is a special form of the trace, which we kind of, where we normalize kind of not by the number of entries in here as well. OK, so typically the trace condition is violated if the eigenvalues of one matrix match nicely those of the, um, the, the other one, OK, the eigenvectors. So if basically the A has too much knowledge about the sigma. So if the A times A transpose, which is something like a covariance matrix of a standard normal distributed Gaussian distribution, if the eigenvectors, which describes this covariance, if they know too much about sigma xx, then they are not independent of each other, and then the trace condition is violated. However, if so, the one for the A times A transpose are super random, somehow in high dimensional space, and the one for the sigma xs are also something completely different, then the trace condition holds. Yeah? Quite interesting. OK, then there's the theorem, as always. So if the trace condition is fulfilled in one direction, yeah, then denoting now the inverse matrix with B, yeah, for the backward model, typically we have an inequality. So it's always smaller, one of the sides. And again, equality is only given in a super boring, non-interesting case. In this case, the case where the A is a rotation matrix, which is just rotating the space. So those, that's like an identity in the IGCI model, right? It's just rotating the space. It's a super boring transformation. It's not doing anything interesting. And that's the case where we have equality. So if we assume we have some interesting mapping with an interesting A, which is not a rotation, yeah, then the trace condition is giving us yet another way to calculate an asymmetry between the forward and backward direction. Again, no noise allowed. 
Why no noise allowed? Yeah, then it messes up the trace condition. Yeah, as you know, additive noise changes the covariance. It's like, I think you even add just the inverse covariance matrices or something. That's what, what's happening if you add some noise. Or are you even adding just the covariance matrices? Maybe you're just adding the covariance matrices. So you're really distorting this criterion. Okay, here's the end. So this is the end, okay? So just one more slide with content. content. So here's the algorithm how to do it practically. You estimate both covariance matrices. You need to estimate these so-called structure matrices, yeah, A and B. And then you just calculate the quotient. So you compare, basically, whether this is equal to 1 or not. So if the trace condition is fulfilled, the quotient is equal to 1. And then you, you pick the one which is closer to 1, and you say, for that direction, the trace condition is fulfilled more. And you say, that is the true direction. OK, great. So summary. So under what assumption can we infer the correct structural causal model? Yeah, only given the joint distribution. Yeah, that's really very little. And we showed that without additional assumption, you have no chance. And then I showed you four very orthogonal different ideas where, of course, now there are more papers and trying, people trying to unite them into one big theory. But at first, they are really very, very different creative ideas um, that allow you basically to be better than random. Question is, of course, how good do they really work in practice? That depends on the assumptions, right? The nice thing about the Gaussian distribution is that being Gaussian distributed, that's a very good assumption because it follows from the central limit theorem. However, these assumptions, they are very special, yeah? And so they don't work always. And so there will be an exercise sheet where you implement them and then run them on the pairs data set, which might be interesting, OK? OK, implement them and try them. That's it. That's the end for, end for today. So thanks for your extended attention. And I see you next week.